Welcome to the Professional Book Nerds Podcast presented by Overdrive. Before we get into today's episode, remember to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Those ratings mean a lot and help us get seen by more folks just like you. You can follow us on social media. We're Pro Book Nerds on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And if you want to email Emma and I, you can send an email to professionalbooknerds at overdrive.com. With that, my guest today is an ex-theater kid turned multi-dimensional creator, writer, media personality, journalist, and podcast host living in New York City. Here to talk about her book, I Didn't Know I Needed This, The New Rules for Flirting, Feeling, and Finding Yourself, out December 12th, it's Eli Rollo. Eli, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So excited to get to talk to you, especially about I Didn't Know I Needed This. Could you kick us off by telling the listeners a bit about it? Sure. So I Didn't Know I Needed This is my debut book. It's a collection of 14 personal essays, and it will be coming out on December 12th. So really soon, we're recording this in November, not sure when it's coming out, but it'll be out on December 12th, and it takes you through the life cycle of being in a relationship from being single to being single again, and just teaches you some really accessible and tangible ways to elevate your lived experience through different lists of rules and tips and tricks and my own experience. So it's very fun, very funny, and I'm very excited about it. So it's all, all good things. Very funny is is the key. I've, I've got a copy right here. How the cover? How did you decide on this cover? It's beautiful. It's like you know, as a as a young millennial, it's I, I relate to it because it's almost millennial pink. <laughs> yes, it's very Instagrammable in that millennial kind of way. Um, <laughs> we were really definitely looking to bridge together, sort of like my passions for creation and writing with also like my passion for the visual as it relates to Instagram and TikTok. So I knew I wanted it to be eye-catching, but I also knew that I didn't want it just to be random. I feel like a lot of books these days, and it's no fault of any authors, but I think a lot of books these days just have random covers that don't really fit what's on the inside. So we really pushed for this cover. And basically we had seen a lot of different iterations of it with a broken candy heart. We loved the theme of a candy heart because we thought it just tied in like, I don't know everything so well. It's so like TikTok, Instagram, Pinteresty, but we realized that like a broken candy heart doesn't really sum up the ethos of the book because what it's really about is you could have your heart broken time and time and time again. But the amazing thing is it's all about your capacity to feel again. And when you have your heart broken, you might feel like you've lost yourself, but you can't actually lose yourself because you're all that you have. So we were talking about those themes and that image. And then we realized it might be like a lot more beautiful if it was a bunch of broken candy hearts in the form of a full heart. So we actually found and licensed that image on Google, sent it to the publisher. And we were like, can we have the same fonts and the same colors, but can the image be this? And so I think what's really special is that I got a massive say in the cover, but it's crazy. Like you never really know with publishing. Like I never, I didn't get a say in like color of the physical book and it's blue, which I just got in the mail and I love it. It's like a beautiful, it's like a beautiful teal turquoise and it has like a metallic pink writing on the spine. So it's interesting how like some choices were made by me, but some weren't at all, but it all came together. I love hearing that you took so much of a presence in the creation of the cover design because right i i get to talk to authors all the time and sometimes it's the like the first thing they handed to me was perfect and i thought it spoke to my characters and then sometimes it's like i know what i want and i think that's really cool about what we see with creators online now that there is a focus on crafting your own space especially with like this where you're talking so personally about your life yeah i think it's definitely one of those things too that you might think that it's not appropriate to use your voice or push back and you should just settle. But I really was encouraged by my team to kind of not settle on the cover. And they told me like when I saw the cover, it would feel like my cover. And I'm glad we took a really long time to get to that point. Like we really worked up to the last minute, but it really worked out for the best. Well, in terms of timing, how long did you spend working on the book? So I signed my book deal in April of 2022, and I signed a six-month contract. Usually contracts are six months, nine months, or a year. 
I had the option for six or nine. And I just thought to myself, like, you never know what's going to happen with TikTok. That was even in the time period where it was maybe going to get banned or something like that. I really wanted to be able to capitalize on my audience um, and kind of bring them into the fold with the process. So I was like, six months it is. So I ended up working for six months, but then HarperCollins was on strike for um, more equitable wages for a lot of their employees. My editor was one of the people on strike. And so we had a brief pause from about October to January, February. So in that time, I actually did have a little bit of extra time, but it was mostly done at that point. Um, And now it's coming out in December. So it was about, honestly, altogether two years from meeting my literary agents to publication would have been a little faster, but things happen. And so I think it actually kind of worked out as like a very regular publishing schedule, I would say. How did you decide on this format, kind of taking that essay approach toward telling kind of these lived experiences? It's really interesting because I think it's so funny. I think about this all the time. So many things that I was doing in college or that happened to me in college, I kind of like departed from because they were like not practical or realistic. And I was like, I need to figure out my life. And now I'm back to doing all of those things. And one of those things was the personal essay. I was just a strong essayist in college as it relates to creative writing. So I would take fiction classes and I would be pummeled, which I think is really good. Like I would sit in workshops and I would get torn up. And I had this like one advanced creative writing professor who would not tell me I was a good writer. And I was so used to people telling me I was the best. So I was literally like, this is evil. Like I was on such a mission to make him like me, but on, on the converse in my, uh, personal essay and like narrative nonfiction classes, I was like the girl. And like the professor would be like, if your essay looks like this, it's good, which was a little embarrassing, but it was definitely like my wheelhouse. Like I was winning awards for personal essay and personal essay was really like my happy place. But who, who are you to be like, I'm going to create personal essay. Like it's crazy. It's like so far reaching. And so I, I never really thought about it, like putting it into actual work. But when my agents reached out to me about signing me and said they had an idea for a book, they were like, we like that you publish personal essay on your Substack blog. And we think that that's a really strong medium for you. I think in the future, I'll definitely branch into fiction and maybe even write long, longer form nonfiction. But I think for now, personal essay is like something that I'm really comfortable and confident writing. And I also just love it. And it felt like a really natural fit for this style of book. I think the first thing I wrote down when I started reading was, what is one of your favorite dates to take yourself on? And I have to ask that. (laughs) Yeah, that's a great question. I'm really big into cafe culture. Like not just like I like coffee shops, like the culture of cafes and like the people that you can meet at cafes. I saw a TikTok of this girl recently and like this harkens back to that feeling. She was saying that like, when she meets strangers and starts talking to them, she always takes it too far. Like she said that she met this mom and daughter at a cafe and like four hours later, she knew everything about them. She And she was like, this is really weird. Like, I don't know how I got here. And I feel like that's so resonant of cafe culture. So I would say if I had like a favorite thing to do by myself or take myself on a date to, it would be to go to cafe and either like have my iPad or have a book or even just like my journal and just like write and create or read and either coffee or wine whatever time of day it is and like just see what I can stumble into I feel like being alone is such a tremendous opportunity to like bring other things into your life whereas like if you're out with a friend like are you necessarily going to like explore strangers or even just have a conversation with someone probably not so I think that any opportunity that lends itself to that kind of a meet cute is really fun and that TikTok like is real it was so hilarious like the way she was describing it I was like that's so something that I would do (laughs) the cafe culture is so much fun like Sometimes you want to be no one. And while you're sitting there, have someone be like, oh, he has a pink beard. What's his story? Like it's, it is nice to stumble into those moments with people. A hundred percent. Now you're also sharing kind of rules for life. Is there a specific moment you look back to that makes you go like, this was the spark for this? I know looking at your story overall for how you came to write this book, uh, between like your your team kind of reaching out with the idea of essays, is there something that sparked? I need to tell this story. I need to share my my rules for getting through the day. I think it's like sort of a two part thing. But the first was that um, my best friend who I write about in the book when we were seniors in college, I was like complaining about how I couldn't figure out like what I was going to do next and that it was so hard to find a job in these creative industries. And I lived with 
five girls, all of whom had a job or a plan for post-grad when we started senior year because they were going into like law school, business, more normal quote unquote paths. And I'm not saying that as better or worse than what I did, but I was choosing actively to pursue creative things. And I was lamenting to her and complaining. And she said, it's really hard to hear you complain because I would kill to be as passionate about something as you are about writing. And that, I mean, that first of all changed my life. Cause I was like, she's so right. Like people tell me all the time, like, you're so lucky that like you have a passion. Like I feel like I don't have a passion and I don't think everybody needs to have like one crazy great passion, like in the cliche way that I do. I think your passions can be so many things and even little things, but that just sparked this thing in me. Like I need to push for this and I need to, I need to like almost shut the fuck up with the complaints. Like sure. It's going to be harder, but I chose that because I'm so passionate that I can't choose something else And what a privilege that is. And so that was sort of the first thing. And then the second thing was um, when I was like in my senior year slash early post-grad, I remember like spending a lot of days just being like depressed, anxious, like really disliking myself. And then I read somewhere that if you live to like 90 years old, you only get like 4,500 Fridays or like something within that number. It's like less than 6,000, but more than 4,000. And that seems like such a small number to me. Like that seemed like a really small number, but it also could seem like a big number. And I was like, what am I doing? Like genuinely, what am I doing? Just like not liking my life and like not being grateful for my life and my body and my health and my family and friends. Like actually, what am I doing? And so I just was like, I'm not doing that anymore. Like I'm going to live like the most exciting life, even when it's like mundane as hell and I'm just going through my day. And that's really what inspired the mindset that then inspired the rules. I think those two things together, that realization that came from me and reading that fact in, in tandem with that conversation with my best friend sort of just brought me to this place where I was like, oh my God, like, wow, like I need to be living, I need to be living larger than I am And I need to be appreciating more. So I think that's kind of what brought me to where I am today. Really just kind of making it about living in every moment that it doesn't matter what those moments are. Some of my favorite days are lazy days with family or friends where, yeah, we might have done nothing. We might have sat around, but it was still time with people that I care about. 100%. I have to ask, because you do share so much that is personal, what did it feel like to put yourself out there like this? You know, I feel like it's, it's interesting because Instagram, like the, the come up of Instagram, I was in eighth grade. And so obviously like my relationship to Instagram is people that I know consuming the content I post. And so it's almost harder for me to be like flagrant. I would say flagrant because I don't want to say authentic because I am authentic on Instagram. But posting on TikTok, it just feels like shouting into a void. Now, I know that factually every single person I've ever met sees those videos, but it's harder. It's it's less of a tangible thing because conceptually the come up of TikTok was like this like open, vast space and not like people posting for other people that they know and like having private accounts to show their friends their lives and whatnot. So in a way, this book feels a lot like TikTok to me, where it's like, I know in my brain that anybody that I've written about could read this, that my family could read this, that my friends could read this, that my boyfriend's parents could read this, that anybody could read this, that I know that loves me or hates me or somewhere in between. But I just like don't really care. Like it, I, in a way, it's like, Maybe I would post about all of this on Instagram. I probably would. But there would just be this feeling of like, oh my God, all these people I know are going to see this. Where like that feeling doesn't exist with the book and it doesn't exist with TikTok and it doesn't exist with my podcast. I think also the more that I see powerful women taking up space to tell their stories, the more I feel excited to do the same. And I hope that me doing that can also empower other people to want to do the same and when I say other women, I mostly mean like non-cis men, you know, the queer community and women and people who typically don't have those spaces. And I just hope that like me having a space, which is definitely easier as a white woman, I can just open up a little bit of a, a, of a window for people to come through and feel excited about telling their own story too, because it's such a scary thing, especially when you're not like a straight man on, online. But I will say it's very, it's very rewarding if you get to a place that you're ready to do it. It is scary to not be a straight man online. (laughs) Yeah. There is something about the the freedom to just be like, I'm letting it go. And whoever is picking it up is picking it up. And it is so refreshing because like, right, you'll see someone on TikTok with hundreds of thousands of views. And then you'll see the video that has like 25 views. And you go like, 
honestly, I'm excited that I'm one of those 25 people that got yes. to see this yes. because that person just, they did their thing. They're doing exactly what you're saying. Let it yes. out there. Let the world hear it. And it drives me crazy as well. People like will villainize like the micro micro influencer, like the people with like less than 10 K less than 20 K who are like trying to post. And it's like, I've seen people make fun of them. Like, who are you trying to be? And I'm like, they're trying to be you. They're trying to be you. And like, you got lucky and you went viral overnight, but they're not going to, they're not getting that because the algorithm doesn't work that way anymore. So for you to shit on them is like, you actually just shit on the industry of influencers as a whole. And it's embarrassing because that's just somebody trying something. And that's really brave. And like, we should be applauding that. I love when I see somebody like on the internet, just trying and doing the thing. And like a lot of times if I see a micro influencer follows me and whatever, I'll always follow back. Like I want to support them too. Like just because someone doesn't have 1 million followers doesn't make them less valuable. And it's really cool that this is like a space that we can really like do whatever we want with, which is so, I don't know, exciting. I know there is something so freeing about the fact that like, yeah, TikTok is the wild west, but in the best way possible. And at some point, my For You page just like connects everything together. I yep. went from seeing videos about the woman who's ba building a tunnel under her house to people talking about the women who the woman yes. who's building a tunnel under her house. And there's something about that. Like, no, there's something about that that's so great. And on top of it, it's like when you see people be like, I hope the algorithm brings me back. And then the algorithm always brings you back. I'm like, it's just so, it's just so like unlike anything we've ever seen or had. And that to me is so special. Like we really need to be like focusing on celebrating, uplifting the fact that we have that. Like when have we ever had that before? There's definitely so many drawbacks, but there's also so many amazing things as well. Yeah. It really has been a gift to see the algorithm treat us right. And it makes me wonder like, how are any of these other platforms still running when TikTok has, has it on lock? Like, Instagram yep. doesn't even show me the people I follow anymore. Yep. I like I but I can watch a video and then 20 minutes later while I'm still scrolling see part 2 through 18. It's amazing. Without even without even trying. It's phenomenal, <laughs> truly. Now, I of course cuz I could get always way off topic to take us back to the book. What are some of the things that folks can expect to hear? What are some of the stories and things that they might relate to? Do you have a, a standout piece that you're really hoping to hear from readers about? That's such a good question. I'm, I'm honestly hoping to be surprised a little bit. And I think I already have been because there's been a good bit of feedback from people that I know and don't know that I've read the book. So I'm looking forward to like that element of surprise, the ability for people to find different things within it. And I think like, okay, it's so funny, you know, like when you're in English class in 10th grade and you're reading a book and it's like raining in the scene of the book where they like are sad and they're like, it's poetic fallacy or pathetic fallacy, whatever the hell that thing is called. Like it's, it's raining. It's supposed to like mean that they're emotionally sad. And I'm like, I always, as a writer, I'm like, did the, did the author really try to do that? Probably not. So I'm curious how many things like that will come up. How many things will surprise me will be things that I didn't intend for people to take away, but they do. And that's like such a beautiful part about the way that we sort of like make pieces of art our own. I'm really excited about that. I think that's going to be really fun. There's always the kid saying, we can't, we don't know what the author meant. The author didn't say that. Oh, 100%. And it's, and it's like annoying that they're saying that, but I'm kind of like, okay, they have a point. Like they I, have a I point. I get what you're going for, but I mean, you are described as Carrie Bradshaw for the TikTok age. What does that feel like? How did you, did you chase that down? Did you come to just like revel in it? It's so interesting. Cause like, I didn't chase it down. Like at all. I was always like, if I had to pick one fictional character who was doing something I wanted to do, it would have been Carrie. I think that's like pretty obvious, but I wasn't trying to emulate her for so many reasons. Like we're different, but I think it felt a little imposter syndrome at first. And I let other people call me that, but I would never be like, I would never like proclaim it myself. It would never be a self-proclaimed thing. But then this past week, I actually for the first time got to meet Sarah Jessica Parker. And we've had a bit of a thing going back and forth just because she had sent me like some shoes with a letter. And so I was pretty, 
I was sure that she was aware of who I was. I didn't know if she knew who I was. And we got to meet in person for the first time. And like, it was very clear that she knew who I was, but also she kind of like gave me this blessing for my career and everything that, everything that's like on the horizon for me that felt very lovely and sentimental. And I think Sarah Jessica Parker is somebody who really emulates parts of Carrie in her own life. And I, and I wonder how much of that was like, before she played the role versus how much of the role reverberated into her life. But she has her own shoe brand and she has her own literary imprint. She's very like writerly um, and scholarly and smart. She loves, she's so well-spoken and like charismatic and stylish. And I feel like having the blessing from her made it feel less imposter syndrome, really. And maybe that's like ridiculous to say, like I needed Sarah Jessica Parker to give me her blessing. <laughs> you but... needed Carrie to walk up and say, <laughs> You're Carrie now. Yeah, no, no, no. I needed her blessing. But I feel like it was a nice thing to like have her be so wonderful and lovely and warm to me. Like she doesn't have to do that. Um, someone that famous does not have to to make like the little TikTok girl um feel good, but she chose to do that. And that really made it feel like, okay, we're doing this. Like, let's go. So I feel that's better great about support. It. Like, oh my God, it's the best support you could ask for. <laughs> you love to see it. And right, just to be like, yeah, I'll send you some shoes, but also let's meet and let's talk about this. That's yeah. awesome. So so you feel pretty good about it. It's not a you're finally like living in it, which is so exciting. Yes, I think I'll embrace it. <laughs> I think it's I think it's worth it because it describes you like to a T. <laughs> Sometimes we watch the show, my boyfriend's like, you are her. It's like scary. Like when she's like um in season five, like with her book and everything. I'm like, oh my gosh, and her cover debacles and whatnot. I'm like, it's so funny. Uh art imitates life. <laughs> no, seriously. Very much so. So becoming an advice guru at like 24. 25 now. But 25 now. Okay. <laughs> did, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you always want to be a writer? And how do you feel about where you're at now? I definitely always wanted to be a writer. That was like so intrinsically tied to who I was and important to me and significant from the, from the jump. Being a writer was like tied to everything and it always was. And so I knew that I was going to be a writer, but I didn't know what kind of writer. And I feel like the path that I've carved out feels really natural now. And it really does call back on my college days and the kinds of things that I was doing that I took a little bit of a break from to try to figure out like what I was going to do in the real world. But it's special that I came back to those things. And I always tell people don't like if you have a big goal or dream, like I want to be a published author, like that's not going to happen overnight. It's okay if you have to backseat it for a little bit or like you have to put it in a box in the basement of your house. But at the end of the day, it's still in your house. It's still in the basement. You have the power to go get it at any time when, it, when the time feels right. So I think for me, it's like the little break that I took from like full steam ahead, like we're going to be a creative author, whatever, was really just placing that on the back burner for a second to try to figure other things out and then other things paved the way for this. So I really do feel like it's been very special, a very good, amazing journey. Um, and I feel very great about where I'm at now. I love that. If you put it in a box in the basement, it's still in your house. Like mm -hmm. that's so important for people to just like soak up. It's still a part of you. What it takes to achieve your dreams doesn't invalidate your dreams, doesn't make a dream impossible. Totally. Looking at kind of this experience so early in life and sharing so much of what you've gone through, putting yourself out there in, in the way that you have is so cool. And it's so inspiring. I also loved your conversations around friendship, that it was not just dating advice. It was not just like this experience. It, it was also about looking at like platonic soulmates and how friends can maintain such an important role in our lives. What is a bit of advice you'd give to the listeners about maintaining strong friendships? I would say to try to start looking at your friendships like you do romantic relationships because we look at romantic relationships like they could end at any time. And because of that, when we're in one, we're dedicating so much time and energy and joy and pain and all the emotions to a romantic relationship because 
we say, oh, romantic relationships require honesty and trust and communication. And we look at our friendships like they're just like this like one straight line that will last forever. And it does our friends a massive disservice because just like in a romantic relationship, how you could both grow and change and you could grow and change apart in a, in a friendship, the same could be true. Or just like in a romantic relationship where someone could do something to hurt the other person and the other person would no longer want to be in that relationship, the same can be true. And I feel like it becomes really destabilizing when you're in your 20s and you start to realize like, oh, my friendships don't last forever. You get so sort of like, emotional and confused and oh my god like I can't believe like this is over like this was supposed to last forever and it's like that's not true and if you start looking at your friendships like your romantic relationship not only are you going to build better friendships because you're going to put in more time and energy but it's also going to be a little bit of an easier cross to bear if and when that friendship does end right you can know that you gave it the most vulnerable parts of yourself the most honest parts of yourself in the same way that you that kind of society tells us that we have to do with romantic relationships. We should be doing that with all of our relationships. 100%. What is the worst thing about dating in the year of the Barbie movie? <laughs> That's a funny question. I So I haven't dated in the year of the Barbie movie, but I have friends that are dating and are like actively single. I would say the worst thing is like the single stories that were sold like online and by society about dating. Like, oh, you ha like if you're single and you're 27, like you better be actively dating at all times because God forbid you were a single woman at that age or like, oh, like if you, you have to use this app to get this thing or you have to do this to get this or if you meet someone and they do this, like that's a red flag and this, that and the other thing. I feel like while social media can be so amazing and empowering, it can also kind of create that kind of issue. And I think that's like a lesser like spoken about thing. It's like something that we don't really like look to as as like maybe massively as we look to, you know, other sort of um advice that we would criticize. Like we don't really criticize that kind of stuff. And it's coming at us from all angles and it makes it really difficult, I think, to to date in in the year of the Barbie movie. <laughs> <laughs> I I saw someone refer to 2023 as the year of the Barbie movie. And I'm like, that's just how I it have is. to call this year out yeah. no matter what. <laughs> Always. As much as we're being served the content that we want to see or things that make us think, we are still getting the toxic part of someone telling us what a red flag is instead of figuring out what our own red flags are. 100%. Re that's really what it is to me. Like we were told, like we almost overcorrect as well. Like, especially if he doesn't do this, he's that. And it's like, okay, dial back. Also, like, fuck him if he breaks up with you. It's like, well, what if someone just freed you by saying, I don't see a future with you? Why is that villainized? You know, so I think there's a lot, a lot that's thrown at us that I don't necessarily subscribe to myself. And it can be pretty damaging, I think, t to young people who are like, those are the lessons that they're learning or, or garnering from the internet about dating. I love to leave a party via the Irish goodbye. Are you a fan of just disappearing or do you have to say goodbye to the host and everyone that you know? I'm definitely a fan of just disappearing, but it depends. Like, yes. it really depends. I feel like a lot of the parties that I'm at, because I'm not really big into parties, but a lot of the parties that I'm at are like work things. And I would never, I want to like make it so clear that if I'm invited some, th somewhere by someone, I'm always going to be like, thank you for having me, blah, 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 whatever. If I'm at like a random person's birthday pregame, I might be like, happy birthday on the way out. But if I'm at like a massive giant holiday party, New Year's party, like I'm just going to leave. Or if I'm at like a bar with a huge group of people, I would just leave and then text like, hey, I left. I think I'm I think I'm getting more confident with just like doing what I want or not going places so I don't have to get into that situation. So I'd say while I'm a fan, it's situational because I never want to sound like I'm like the most disrespectful person on the face of the earth. I'm just like a little awkward. Sometimes something isn't going to be like my favorite thing in the world to do. So I would say that's that's kind of my POV. Like if you're being respectful about it and it doesn't really matter, just go. Right. Uh, no, absolutely. I am a fan of if the situation is appropriate, just disappearing into the background. Get out of there, yeah. I'm so happy that I left my house and I'm so happy that I'm going home to my house. Like 100%. Is... Can't believe I'm here. Beautiful. Yeah. Can't believe I'm here. Can't believe I'm not home. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the jar. <laughs> your your family's snack fixation 
blowing up online. That had to have been a time. <laughs> yeah, it was a time. I think something that's like so sort of fun and like funny about it is the fact that we were working during the pandemic because my dad owns restaurants. So and my whole family was working. We had a very different like pandemic than a lot of people. And we were coming home at the end of a day of working in a restaurant and opening wine and being crazy in the kitchen. And the, the jar as the, the account, not the actual jar was born out of that sentiment. And I think that that's really like funny because these days it's really evidenced of like what I, who I am. And it, and it feels like it, even though it's like, okay, that's how you got TikTok followers. Like what the hell? It's also just like sweet. And I think like, I never forget where you came from for lack of a better phrase. What is your current snack fixation? What's your, what's your current go-to? Oh, that's such a good question. I like switch up a lot on snacks, but I, of course, just saw a TikTok about this and it like reminded me, have you ever had those? And like, this is going to sound gross, but those Chobani yogurt flips. Yes. Okay. Okay. I saw a girl being like, if you want to elevate your entire life, all you have to do is get one of these. She was like, let's talk about the packaging. Like you flip it, you're mixing it. I was like, she's so right. I had to go buy them because I used to love them when I was in high school. The like almond cocoa loco, like change lives. Like that shit's so good. So I was literally cracking up. I was like, this girl's hysterical. And so then I went out and bought them and I've been eating them for a snack like every single day. Like they're just so good. And I completely forgot about them too. Right. Every time I'm like putting the order in for my normal Chobani yogurt, I'm like, why am I not getting the flips? Why am I not having key lime pie at 9 a.m.? Yeah, key lime pie. (laughs) It's a key lime pie one for me. Yeah. Dump it in. Dump it right in. It's so good. Um, I was cracking up over your American Girl adult brunch because why not? No, What brought you to that? (laughs) Honestly, my friend, I'm sure you're familiar, maybe you're not, but if anybody isn't familiar, Harry Hill was like into the American girls, like loving it. He like definitely started it. We went to an event, they sent me one and I was like, I just feel like making this like a content thing. So then I was like, I want to go to the American girl cafe. Cause I think that's so funny. And my brother was like, I'll go with you. And then it was just like, from there, hilarious. Like this was like the onset of that becoming a thing to do. And it was so clear that the staff there was just like so happy to not be serving seven-year-olds and not that they don't like serving seven-year-olds. The staff there is wonderful, but they were just like, oh, finally, like kids that are going to get drunk, like this is fun. (laughs) And so we had a great time and it was like hilarious. And from then on, it was always just like a thing. And um, people still bring it up, even though it was like a year ago. Well, maybe a little longer than a year ago, but it was so fun. Like that was a beautiful moment. Like truly. As a Barbie collector, anytime I see people just embracing childhood love in any silly way. And I I didn't even think about that idea. I love the thought of knowing that the the staff there was just like, oh, finally. Someone finally, who yeah. I can like make a joke at and not have it be a problem. Someone yeah, who, like, who gets someone, it. Exactly. Somebody who gets it. Someone's gonna have like fun with us like make the day a little brighter. It was great. Now, I also wanted to bring up your podcast and wanted to give you a chance to just like share with my listeners what what you talk about, your show. I love the way that you announce new episodes as the congeniality like times. Yeah, (laughs) thank you. That's my very talented assistant. But, you know, I... I started a podcast actually, which is so interesting because in grad school, I took an audio journalism class and I just like really enjoyed like that class. I thought it was just like an amazing class. And after that, I was like, okay, I want to like do more of this. This has been so fun. And so from there, like one thing led to the next and I started a podcast and now we have the best time all the time. And it's something I look forward to every week. And, you know, of course, like everything that is a part of my brand is in a way a business, but the podcast to me, like, and while I do want to like scale it and like want to grow it, it feels less competitive to me and more of a way for me to just like connect to my audience, which I think like maybe isn't the greatest thing to say when you have like a team and finances riding on that um, as a part of a business. But for me, like it's just an intimate way to connect to my community and audience. And I love like how intimate that is. And I'm sure you understand as a podcaster yourself. I do. And this is, this is the same thing for me. It's just a part of my nine to five. Like this is something that I get to add in for fun. And it is so cool when you get to hear from the people that care about what you're sharing Totally. It's super rewarding. 
It's the best. It's the best. But I'm with you. There's there's that part of me that's like, yeah, do I want to like blow things up and take it to the the top of the world? Of course. Do I also 100%. just feel fully chill and love that it's happening? Also, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, always. Now with touring, you're about to be going on tour, right? Yes. How does it feel to have a, a book tour coming up and tour dates and places to go? It's definitely something that I've not experienced before, but being that I have a theater background, I feel like that really helps. <laughs> like the idea that in the back of my head, I've done this before. The stage is something I'm super familiar with. I'm comfortable with it, all of that stuff. I'm like, okay, it's just like putting on a play. So that feels really comforting. And also I'm so excited to meet my audience. That's been something that I've wanted to do since I started this and haven't had the chance to. So I think it's all in all going to be amazing. And I'm just putting out the best energy possible for it. What are you most looking forward to, to the tour? And what are your travel essentials? I'm really looking forward to seeing cities that I haven't seen before. I've never in my life been to San Francisco or Atlanta. So I think those are the two that I'm like, okay, so fun. Like, love that. Um, so that's going to be really great. Travel essentials. That's such a good question. I've never like traveled like this before, like every weekend. So I feel like, I feel like it's going to, I feel like we're going to figure it out as we go. Maybe like Advil. <laughs> Cause like, you know, for now I have things that I think are my travel essentials, but I'm like, oh Jesus, this is going to be so different than anything I've ever experienced. So I'll have to get back to you on that. Cause I'm not entirely sure yet, but I would say like definitely something good to read some, some painkillers for the headache. <laughs> I always get a headache when I travel. I don't know about you, but like the altitude change makes me sick. So I'm like those two things, a good read, a good book and some Advil. <laughs> definitely Advil. Um, and advice as someone who's traveled perhaps too much in their career, uh, bring moisturizer and plenty of it and make oh, sure yeah. you have a favorite one that you can pick up at like a Target. I mean, I guess there's Sephora everywhere now, but like you're going to be so dry from hotel to airplane so to, yeah. You're right. That's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Keep that one in mind because- I will. Ooh, <laughs> I get the, the best dry spot, like right in the center. Yeah. And when you're bald, that's all they can see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's so funny. To start to wind us down, I have some questions from a nosy podcaster. That's me. Uh, what are you reading or listening to right now? Okay, so I just finished The Vanishing Half, which was very good. And I'm going to start um, Tom Lake by Ann Patchett today. So that's what I'm reading. Listening to podcast-wise, I love the Giggly Squad Girls, so I'm always listening to them. That one's really good. And in terms of music, I feel like in the fall and winter, I'm always like evermore Taylor Swift. Like it's so fitting for this time of year. But I'm also an early Christmas music listener, so we've already gotten that in the fold. Same. <laughs> Of course, of course. I, I saw your stocking and I was like, oh, I'm in good company. When I yes. started the Zoom, I was like, ooh, maybe it's too early for my Christmas. No, lights. I love no. it. <laughs> I love it. When I say public library, what comes to mind? Oh, that's such an interesting thing. Maybe the New York Public Library. Think of the lions outside. <laughs> yeah. And I've been inside before. It's really beautiful. And a lot of writers like to write there. What is your go-to Chipotle order? White rice, no beans, double steak, and then cheese, pico, and lettuce. And then I do a side of guac and a side of sour cream. I don't love when it's on the bowl because I like when the bowl comes, if like, or if I pick it up, I like to heat it up again at home because I like to eat it hot, like not room temp. A lot of people are like chill with it room temp. I'm not. So you can't have sour cream and guac on it. You have to have it on the, the side, dipping wise. Your order is so similar to mine. Like, yeah, <laughs> yes, that's so funny. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I have never been too mad at like the it's just fresh, kind of hot, a little room temp, but yeah, I'm gonna start putting my sour cream on the side so I can reheat you it. Should, I you like should. that. Then you can reheat it. It's great. What project that you can talk about, of course, are you working on right now? Oh, that's such a good question. Well. We're currently in, in the works for my second book. So obviously, like, we haven't sold it yet. We're not – we haven't pitched it yet. We have a ways to go. But um, I've finished with the pitch document. So that's always exciting. Yeah, so I can't really, like, share much more about it. But that's something that really excites me. And now that the strike is over, I would love to, you know, start considering what it looks like to dabble into 
Hollywood of it all, the film and TV industry. So I haven't really like started any projects in a dedicated way, but I would love to like think more about that. But you've got like exciting plans in the fire. Yes. yes. Oh, I love that. Um, And where can the listeners find you online? Shout out all your things. I know you've got plenty of them. (laughs) So you can find my Instagram, Eli.Rallo. My TikTok is just first and last name, no space, no dot. The podcast is on the Instagram. And if you want to pre-order the book, you can go to my website, which is just EliRallo.com. And everything else should also be on the website if you want to come to the book tour, if you want to um, email me, whatever that, whatever it is that you need, that should be on the website. Awesome. Before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like listeners to take away from, I didn't know I needed this? Gosh, I hope they just feel I hope they just feel empowered to choose themselves and to to always remember that like their voice and their choice is the most important thing that they have in their life and to hold that close to them. Well, Eli, thank you so much for being here and chatting with me. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Listeners, make sure you pick up I didn't know I needed this on December 12th. Follow Eli on social and as always, happy reading. Thank you. Bye. Readers can sample and borrow the titles mentioned in today's episode on Overdrive.com or in Libby. Our library friends can purchase these titles in Marketplace. Professional Book Nerds is proud to be an Evergreen Podcast signature program. To learn about other Evergreen podcasts, visit evergreenpodcasts.com. Our podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Emma Dwyer and Joe Skelly and presented by Overdrive. To learn more, visit professionalbooknerds.com. 